An Honorable Profession is brought to you by Tech for America, an organization dedicated to providing a platform to solve America's toughest public challenges. For more information, visit t4a.org. That's T, the number four, a.org. Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. An Honorable Professions and New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports some of the most thoughtful and innovative voices in American politics. If you don't believe me, listen to some of our past episodes with guests like Mayor Pete Buttigieg, Deshara Jones, Congressman Ben McAdams, and more than a dozen amazing leaders at the state and local level. You can find us at newdealleaders.org or wherever podcasts are found. Today, I'm talking with Laura Capps. Laura's a member of the Santa Barbara School Board, and she's had a remarkable career in public life. She worked for the Clinton administration, John Kerry's presidential campaign, and for Senator Ted Kennedy. When she's not in a school board meeting, she runs a firm that advises national nonprofits and other organizations. Recently, she co-founded with entrepreneur Joe Sandberg, Working Hero Action, an effort to expand the earned income tax credit to end poverty and help working Americans. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. So before we get into the the intricate details of uh, school politics and school funding, uh, why don't we start with your path into politics? You obviously come from a political family, but have you been passionate about politics for your whole life or, is, or did something happen in college or, and certainly we know right after um, where you really got engaged in national politics? Yeah, it's been a kind of a lifelong interest and at some point became a passion, but yeah, I mean, as long as I can sort of remember, I started running for things in elementary school, you know, council and things like that. And, and, and mostly it really stems from my parents. Before they them got, they got into politics, they were just very civically active. And, you know, my, my dad was a professor and my mom was a nurse before getting into politics. But they, it, for me, it really stemmed from their sense of religion and, and public service and, how you're here on earth to look after others. And so I grew up just very engaged in nonprofit work that they were engaged in and our church and just this calling to public service sort of generally. And in a very non-cynical way, I feel that they gave me a lot of gifts, but that's a huge one for me is that they were um, not blind to the negative sides of politics, but but very much not cynical and sort of saw the best of it. And that's what, what was passed on to me. And so, yeah, you've managed to stay uh, profoundly involved both in your professional capacity, advising nonprofits, but then also in your uh, commitment to being on a school, local school board uh, and involved in national politics. How did you stay not cynical in this day and age? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, it's really because the people that I get to work with keep me from becoming cynical. I mean, you can sort of get jaded by the system and uh, certainly with our you know, who's in the White House and our national politics, but the people that I've worked with along the way, by and large, are all in it for the right reasons. And so, you, you know, it's like sort of the forest of the trees is almost the opposite. The trees that I get to work with <laughs> are just wonderful people um, who are, you know, really care. And from a lot of most cases are not doing it for any kind of recognition or certainly not any money, right? Um, but they just are, you know, they're trying to make trying to make their community or trying to make this country a better place. Even, you know, in the, in the White House, you know, in, in the West Wing at a young age, and I find that, you know, serving on boards of nonprofits uh, in, in Santa Barbara. So, uh, and very similar types of people. And so I feel privileged that, you know, you get to work with people who, you know, wake up every day, read something in the paper, kind of want to do something about it. And can you talk a little bit about that initial path into politics, into the White House, as we hopefully have some young listeners, uh, who are who are listening and looking for how to get involved and maybe are excited about 2020 how do how if you're coming out of college do you do you engage in national politics and you you sort of found an immediate path um, what, what was your story yeah thank you know first it, it sounds kind of corny but just by believing you can 
And uh, my parents took us, a family, to a, um, Washington, D.C. when I was nine, sort of a spring break trip. And I remember distinctly walking around kind of near the Jefferson Memorial, looking at all the big buildings. And my dad said to me, you know, you could work here someday. And I thought, I thought, really? And he's like, oh, yeah, you could. And so I just decided I would then. And, um, and you know, interning is the way to go. And I recognize that there's some economic challenges with that. And I was, you know, lucky that I could sort of figure out how to do that and had the support of my parents. But I just lined up an internship after college. And my, my advice is, you know, if you're, if you really care about the news business, you know, just to sort of put yourself um, where you want to be. And if you can work for free and you're good, uh, something will happen. Something good will happen. Some door will open, might not be at that exact place, but you'll meet somebody that then has something. So um, really just putting yourself in the right environment where you want to be eventually. And I always tell my students, yeah, go back and intern and tell everybody from the first day you're there that you're interning right now, but you're looking for a job. Exactly. Uh, and start your job search early and use it to go forward. But you found a job working for George Stephanopoulos uh, under President Clinton. What was that like? Oh, it was, I mean, just fantastic on so many levels. Uh, just super lucky, too, and I should preface it. I mean, my timing was great. I got an internship in the White House after graduating uh, that then, you know, for Stephanopoulos himself, and then his assistant was on her way out, and I worked I think I worked the hardest I've ever worked those three months as his intern because I knew that if I proved myself that I had a chance at that job. So I worked seven days a week and was happy to do anything. And she was kind of phasing out and I got the job at age 22, almost 23, um, right there in the West Wing. His um, his only assistant, our, our offices was connected to the Oval. So I had the honor of seeing President Clinton on a regular basis and and part of this, you know, tight knit West Wing family, um, at a young age, obviously, uh, you know, I leaned a lot on my skills as a hostess <laughs> at restaurants because you have to have sort of grace under pressure and um, know how to roll with the punches and a lot of a lot of high stakes environment without sort of you know knowing exactly all the things that were were in play. And also too, he was just a wonderful first boss for me to have, first real boss. I had other jobs like I mentioned um, in restaurants and things, but. Because he, you know, he just is—he he is who you see on TV. He's just a really nice, genuine person, and treated me really well. Never raised his voice, and and just showed me from an early stage that you can be very powerful um, and have a lot of influence, and still treat people around you in a good way. So I was very motivated to work hard for him. Yeah, and he was motivated by faith as well, right? To as community service, he so. was, and it was, yeah. Yeah, it was something we really connected on um, is his family. You know, he's the son of a long line of Greek priests. Um, and my, you know, I have that in my family. And um, and, and his family was, you know, I, 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 I interacted with them a lot. And that was a nice part of the job. So you were working, uh, you've worked in the Bill Clinton White House. Then you worked for Senator Kerry as communications director. You worked for Ted Kennedy. But at some point, you've decided to come home to your hometown of Santa Barbara uh, and uh, get engaged in local politics there. What what drove that decision? Really, it was about uh, where I wanted to raise my son and just having grown up in such a beautiful, caring community of Santa Barbara, I knew that um, I wanted to give him what I had, the you know, what I was lucky to have <laughs> growing up in a place it's not only, you know, seven degrees almost every day. And as a kid, that's pretty great, (laughs) but also just a a very tight knit community where people, um, you know, I think we have the highest uh, rate of nonprofits per capita. There's just, it's an involved community. And again, you know, my parents were, were really active, like in environmental issues and other things. And so um, I I just, it's just where I wanted to be home Uh, and sort of that mysterious question of, you know, knowing where you want to end up. It's just when, when do you start ending up? <laughs> and so uh, the birth of my son was really the, the motivator there. And I moved back a couple of years after he was born. And so he's really only known, he was born in DC, but he's really only known Santa Barbara. And then just professionally. Yeah. I mean, I, I was also interested, it did sort of coincide with a feeling that, you know, national politics is really important, but I wanted to explore local and made a very, you know, intentional decision to to still be somewhat active in national 
politics and, and nonprofits, but, but zero in on the, the, um, the organizations that, that make this community of Santa Barbara what it is. So that's, you know, so, so it dovetailed with my, my, a career choice that was intentional. And so running for school board, my, so my dad yeah. was, uh, was, uh, a mayor of Santa Cruz. And when I started getting interested in politics, he says, you can run for any office you want, but don't run for the school board. Uh, cause the <laughs> politics are too hard. And when you're dealing with people's kids, it's, 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 it's extra. There's an emotional element to it in addition to the complexities of educational policy. So I always have tremendous admiration for people who engage on school boards. So tell me about your decision to run for the school board. And then, you know, uh, for all those listeners at home who may not know how school boards can and can't impact educational policy, you know, what's that job like? Yeah, that's a good question. For, you know, I, I was a product of the, these local schools, um, public schools. And I just, it's, I believe that our public schools are the cornerstone of our democracy. If they're strong, then our country is strong. Uh, and so when I was looking to get involved in public service in my hometown, the school board just seemed like a natural uh, notion. Also, again, kind of fo- focused on my son. He was, he was going to be starting kindergarten at the school where I went. So it's sort of, you know, selfishly a little bit, you know, I'm going to be engaged in his education. I might as well really know what's going on. Right. And, um, and, um, and the schools here are good. So it's, it is, it's also a size, you know, it's not, uh, LA unified, which I have such respect for that work, but you can actually make a difference here. And I'm not saying you can't in other, in other big metropolises. It's just this district is, a good size. It's big enough in this area. It's, uh, you know, 16,000 kids and 21 schools, but it, you know, we can have, you know, we can actually see, uh, our, our impact. And so that really just kind of went into my calculation of what would be a good way in which for me to serve, um, kind of newly back to my hometown, but having been a product of, you know, these elementary school, junior high, high school. The job, let's see, you went in personal. Yeah, it's very personal. People get extremely passionate, and they should. Um, when they feel as though their child is not getting <laughs> what they deserve, it, there's nothing that's you know more important in that person's life. And so what I like most about the job is the fact that um, I am a parent on the board. And currently, um, my wonderful colleagues have all had kids that have gone through the system, but I'm the only one um, of the five of us who um, is, a, is a current parent. So that means twice a day, I'm on that campus where I drop off my son and pick him up in the afternoon. And so it gives me just a wonderful chance to hear from people. And they do, you know, from parents. And they have questions that um, range from, you know, emotional, as you said, or just simply, you know, they it's bureaucratic. And so they don't know how to, you know, who to ask about um, a simple question. And so being able to track that down for a parent who's concerned or being able to just listen to their concerns about the curriculum or a special ed program or whatever it might be and, and listen and know that, that, you know, that their thoughts aren't going on deaf ears and I can do what I can to try to, um, either help them get the answers or, uh, even better, you know, if I can help make, make a change to whatever concern that they have. And what sort of can and can you not impact at the school board level? We have, presidential candidates talking about education. We have Mm -hmm. education secretary that has, I think, some incomplete thoughts about uh, education or wrong thoughts about education. So where where does sort of the rubber meet the road for a school district trustee in terms of getting good education to the kids in their district? Incomplete thoughts. That's a good, that was a very diplomatic description. (laughs) Very, that's that's as diplomatic as I could be. Uh. (laughs) Yes, incomplete. Is that like, not even an F, that's like it's just an incomplete, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah, you know, that's been been challenging because I have worked in a legislative body where, um, and I I loved, um, I loved working in the United States Senate and certainly with my parents having been in Congress, I know about legislative at work and how you can present a bill and you can move it through. And even if it doesn't succeed, you've, that's an action. So being on a school board, probably the most challenging 
part of it is to just sort of recognize what you can't do. And I also recognize why those things you don't really want a school board to come in and impose a certain sort of dogma or curriculum, right? Those choices need to be made by uh, education professionals. So we're really, we're really, we, we hold the coin purse. So we're the, we have our, our ultimately, we, um, our two most important roles is that we are fiscal, fiscal responsibility, um, and we pass the budget every year. And through that, we can impact. And then our second one is to hire and fire the, the superintendent who really runs the school. So we are, we are a governing body. I should add, we're basically volunteer too. We just get a small stipend. So this is far from a full-time job for any of us, uh, any of the five of us who serve. And I'm, I know that that's the case for most school boards across the country. So that's a challenge um, is that, you know, we're not actually in the day-to-day uh, as it's put, you know, we do sort of the why and we set sort of the tone and the big picture and some of the vision, but not the in the weeds of actually running the school. And what do you, how do you come down on this idea of local local control and local preference? Because as I, as you mentioned, there's a lot of great things that a Santa Barbara school district could do that are innovative and interesting, but you probably don't want to have every school district in every city and county across this country setting different educational standards or using different textbooks uh, or approaches to education. Where do you think, having worked at the federal level and having worked at the local level, how, where, where's that balance? That's a really, that's a great question. And I say that from the vantage point of a Californian, as you are, right? So, yeah. uh, you know, where even though um, our Department of Education in the state is certainly bureaucratic, it's it's progressive. And I think that, you know, just as an example, one thing that we're trying to do is dual language immersion. And, and you know, there was a big movement two decades ago to, to sort of take away bilingual education in California. And now, uh, as all the science <laughs> and research proves, it's a really great thing for kids um, to be bilingual and to learn a second language at a young age. It's, as I can attest, it's much harder later. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, but I'm, I'm in a state and you're in the, in the same state where that's, that's actually being um, supported from the very top of our state. And so as a district in Santa Barbara, we're, we're moving forward with some pilot projects to do dual language. We have a charter school that's entirely dual language. But so I guess it's, it's to answer your question, which is a little, you know, it's great if things are mandated from, from above when you agree with them. I right. can imagine it's not so great when I, when you don't, right? So, and that's where you have to sort of figure out how to exert um, your local needs. But I have yet to f- sort of find an issue where I, we differ from the state. If anything, it's more just the way in which um, the bureaucracy is run and sort of some questions about that. But, you know, another example is school safety. Um, our state really mandates um, robust school safety plans, and that's been a focus of mine since I've been on the board to make sure that our schools are as safe as possible. But, uh, you know, we have the backing of, of, the, of the State Department of Education. I have to say, you know, when it comes to the federal, I've, there's very little, um, thankfully, that comes up in our regular business that is directly related to what's happening on the federal level. And I get that question a lot, you know, sort of how is how is Betsy DeVos, you know, impacting our schools? I haven't, I mean, I'm happy to report I haven't haven't seen an example. It's so interesting because, it, you know, it takes up such a big part of our national conversation, what happens in Washington, D.C., but, um, but you're there on the ground, you're making educational policy, and although we have a really completely crazy approach to education coming out of Washington, D.C., it's interesting that it has very little effect on the day-to-day operations of the school district. It, yeah, I mean, it certainly does symbolically. And um, one of the first things, in fact, the first thing um, I did as a school board member is, is work to pass a resolution. This is right after uh, Trump was elected in 16 um, on immigration, declaring our schools safe spaces. We have a lot of um, immigrants and, and kids of immigrants, and there was real panic and real fear. So our district uh, had these sort of series of town halls to explain the families, you know, what the rules were and how they could be protected in our schools and, their, you know, that ICE wasn't going to be welcome and all of that. And, and we passed, as a school board, we passed a resolution. So I, so I think it's more um, the way that we're impacted by the federal is at least what I've 
my involvement has been more kind of on the emotional and symbolic level of, of um, you know, making sure that we can kind of assure parents that you might be hearing about this, these policies or, but yet we, we, we're creating our own, our own systems here and, and they're still intact and what you know is, is not going away. That has been my, that was my worst day post Trump uh, election was meeting with uh, undocumented parents from our local schools mm-hmm. uh, and having them talk, first of all, trying to reassure them, but then second, have them talk through, you know, what happens if they get deported and their right. kids who are citizens right. are still here and what kind of documents right. they need to sign. It is, as a, as you know, as a parent, having that conversation is just the scariest, um, heart-wrenching thing uh, you can yeah. do. Yeah, and you can't, you're right, because you can assure them that, you know, we create these safe spaces, but it is a new world. And, you know, practical advice, like making sure your emergency card is completely filled out, right? <laughs> so yeah. that if, if something happens, your, your kid is, uh, we know where, we know who to call and we know what to do uh, as a district. So that was a, a key part of these town halls that we did. Um, and we also, you know, we also live in a town where our, our police force is, is well regarded. So, and there's great relationships and, and the officers are, you know, often part of the schools and, um, so we, we partnered with them in, in several of these town halls to um, sort of, again, reinforce that safety message. Yeah. And it's crazy because it's, as you, as you mentioned, it's, it's in some practical ways, it's, it's not really impactful. But when that fear is instilled right. into a community, that, that has ripple effects in very real and tangible ways, even though it's, even though it's, even though there's not much from a policy point of view, but just from a, from a perception and a and a fear element, it it can just profoundly impact lives. Oh sure, I mean, what I one of the main issues I work on, kind of in my day job, is um, is is hunger and food security. And the biggest issue we face is that people don't fill out their um, forms for free and reduced lunch because of fear of putting down a social security number or whatnot. And so, therefore, they're you know, their kid, their child is then not given this wonderful federal, I should say, federal program. So there is that, that practical element of a federal program that reimburses school districts or through the states um, for food. But, you know, there's a gap of about, um, you know, only about 65% of kids are actually getting the, the free meals. And, the, um, and again, the, the barrier is, there's many barriers, but one is just a, a fear factor of putting down information that then might um, somehow harm. And so we, we, I put a lot of effort in to try to, to close that gap and make sure that all the kids who need um, our wonderful food, because it is actually really great here in Santa Barbara, organic and local and all that, um, can get it. Yeah. it's And it's so frustrating because you're talking about kids going hungry during the school day, which is bad yeah. for them. It's bad for learning. It's bad for the classroom. And like, it just seems seems as though as a country we could get to the basics and at least agree on that kids shouldn't be hungry during their school day. But it's it's shocking that we're in a world where we're watching more and more people who are are, are giving up on, on food that they're entitled to uh, because of this fear. Right. And and a program, I mean, a program that was started under Johnson, uh, you know, that is tried and true. What's more fundamental than, than food and so I'm grateful for that, for that federal involvement of reimbursing and give, you know, making sure that kids can eat. It's just this getting from point A to B is a, a bit of a challenge. And, um, and, you know, and just also, like I mentioned, our district has made great strides to, to make sure that food is healthy because, uh, you know, you also put, you know, chemicals and sugar and starch in, in little bodies. It, it also makes heart, learning hard. So we've, we've put an emphasis on that in recent years and I'm really proud of, of the food that we serve. And it's an area that I've really focused on uh, and my time on the school board. And so moving from those little bodies to your little body yeah. uh, and your son, <laughs> uh, talking about uh, families and public life, you had a really interesting yeah. uh, op-ed in Politico about how how hard it is to be a good mother or a father and a member of Congress. Um, And this comes from your experience of having seen it close up. You were an adult when your parents went to 
Congress, but you, but you obviously know that institution well. What do you see in terms of the challenges of public life and balancing family? Yeah, that's such a good question. And it's also one you never want to complain about these jobs because they are, you know, they are an honor, <laughs> an honorable profession is, is the name of this podcast. And, and so I don't, but it, they are, but now actually serving, um, I just have such a profound respect for the, the people that have figured out how to navigate them because it's, it, it is really challenging to, to create that balance with your own family. And as a result, most people don't do these jobs while they have, while they're raising their kids. And that's the op-ed I wrote in Politico last year, because it was during the time, I think the sort of the news hooks of the, of the op-ed were um, that Senator Duckworth had a, you know, a baby and first baby to be born to a Senator uh, in office. Um, and, and similar, it was when Paul Ryan uh, said that he was retiring to spend more time with his family. And, you know, I believe him. Um, but, but it got me thinking because I came close to running for Congress. And at the time, my son uh, was three. And I just couldn't fathom the schedule if I were to have been successful. Um, and so it just got me thinking. I did some research about how hard it is um, on especially women who tend to be more of the caretakers directly. And that's not necessarily fair. It's a lot of great dads out there, but during those early years. And so therefore women don't generally run until later. So the model is more of a Nancy Pelosi model. Um, you know, after she raised her kids, then she, then she really jumped in herself and, and played more of a supportive role up until then in terms of her political engagement. So I do think, and having seen Congress, I do think things can change. You know, it doesn't have to have the schedule that it does. It's a very unfamily unfam- friendly institution. Women, you know, notoriously just got a bathroom uh, near the, you know, near the floor of the House of Representatives in like 2006 or some craziness. Um, but, you know, it's exciting to see all these new women who were elected this in 2018 and to see what kind of changes they'll impose. Katie Porter from um, Orange County, the congresswoman, she, she and I have connected on this front because she's actually a single mom. I mean, goodness, uh, she's got three kids and she's trying to make this work. And to be in California, it's a whole nother factor of, of distance. And I saw the schedule that my mom kept for 18 years. It's grueling. It's just, that's all it is. It's grueling. Uh, the back and forth, you spend basically two days a week in transit and um, missing out on anything uh soccer for me it would have been soccer games and all that all that fun stuff that you get to do uh when your kids are young and how do you find the balance it's obviously much easier that when you don't have to fly back and forth (laughs) from washington dc and cover a huge district (laughs) but how do you find the balance because you have a you have a career you have uh uh you're serving on a school board which as you mentioned is um is uh, virtually unpaid, but there's always constituents and there's always issues and there's always schools uh, and teachers to meet with. Um, and you have a family. So how do you, how do you, what do you do to balance it all? Well, let me know when you find <laughs> out. I mean, I, I just, <laughs> it, it, it always, sometimes I feel like I, I figured it out and that usually is a, a fleeting moment, but no, I mean, I do, this job is a school board is great because it does coincide so much with where my son is at right now. So, and he's also that fun age of, you know, he's about to turn eight. And so getting him to go with me to a school event or something isn't too much of a struggle. I imagine that's going to get more so as he (laughs) approaches his teenage years. But so, you know, it kind of just, it kind of works and it sometimes doesn't as much. And I question everything uh, all the time because that's sort of what you do. And, um, but just being so close and everything's, you know, I'm, you know, within walking distance to his school and I can volunteer in his class and just kind of setting up um, an environment where he, he comes first and knowing that that means that my career isn't quite as necessarily on the front burner as it will be um, later and as it was for the, you know, for the first 10, 20 years of my life. So it's just kind of recognizing that there's a time and a season for things. And right now um, he's, He's first and foremost. Yeah, that's a that's a good age. Uh, I was I took my four year old son to a political event the other day, and I'm trying to give a speech, and I look over, and he has his shirt off, and he's dancing <laughs> uh, in the middle of the Democratic yeah. Women's Club, and I was like, oh, there you go. Is, <laughs> come on, dude, yeah, shirt on time. Yeah, no, it's fun, right? Yeah, he's he's expressing himself. Uh-huh. Um, 
my son, my son, you know, wait, he's so, he's so, <laughs> we were walking to something. I took, took him to some of that and he goes, wait, is this a protest or a fundraiser? <laughs> 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 so That's... trying to figure out what, what, what I was taking him to. As you know, uh, even though it, it, there may be times when it's under unappreciated later on, it, it, hopefully will be appreciated uh, for the exposure and getting to see the the value of public service. At least that's what I keep telling myself. Oh, sure. Right, exactly. So uh, I wanted to sort of round it out here by tapping into your experience in national politics. And as as we have all these candidates sort of making their way out into the country and uh, making their case for why they should be president, as a veteran political uh, operator and somebody who's who's worked it in the White House what are you looking for when you see these candidates um, you know put themselves on the national stage oh that's a good question well first of all I, I'm a happy Democrat right now I just am excited about all of these options and to be you know seeing people you know whom we know our wonderful mayor Pete uh, yeah. is just on fire right now um, and you know Cory Booker who's also involved with New Deal. I just loved his video and and um, his CNN town hall. So I'm just, you know, I, 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 my lens is a very optimistic one. Uh, what I'm looking for, this is a bit insider, uh, but that's kind of the nature of your question. I'm kind of looking at who they're hiring uh, and, and sort of what that signals to me. Um, there's some great talent and, and who's going where and what that means and kind of what the structure is. I mean, it's really hard to run for president and you have to be a good manager and, it's also, you know, setting up a, a campaign. When I worked for John Kerry in 2003 and 2004 on his presidential campaign, when I started, it was about 30 of us. I was in Iowa. And then by the end, it's, you know, 3,000. And that takes a lot of organizational prowess. So it's kind of a weird answer potentially to your question, but I'm, I'm really kind of tracking uh, their hiring moves at this stage and kind of their operations because I do think it bodes well, although our president doesn't fit this description, but just the, you know, sort of what they're, what they're, the campaign structure that they're building. Yeah. And I think this is something uh, that maybe, maybe those who are watching the horse race aren't zeroing in on, but you know, and it, it's, it's, as you said, it's tough to build an organization to run a national campaign when you only have two or three candidates. It's extraordinarily hard right. when there's 20 candidates and everyone's competing for the f- few people who have done it before. Are you seeing right. Are you seeing anyone who's who's really building an extraordinary uh, organization at this point? Well, yeah, Mayor Pete, uh, Pete. I mean, he's just. I just understand he's opening a Chicago office. I am on. You know, I get the emails from him and just the transparency by which the fundraising emails are coming out and sort of a sense of connectedness to the campaign is refreshing. So I, I just, I, I'm very excited about the way he's building this and and taking advantage of the, you know, sort of streak that he's on in a really smart way. Yeah. In a really authentic way. I think that he, you know, his personality, because again, we know him. So, but it's, it's, his personality is coming across, you know, and he's relatively unknown. I mean, almost completely unknown, right? Right. He is, he's really having a moment and it's extraordinary because now I got, I've had a couple of students at, uh, from college students calling up and saying, Hey, I want to, I'm ready to dedicate my life to this guy. I'm ready to go. So you know it's sort of saturating down to the to the activist level when when that's happening. Totally. Yeah, I've had the same. A few people have reached out to me, like, how can I get involved? And these are pretty established Democrats, right? So uh, it's interesting to you know just to see how this moves. And it's early, of course. Uh, you know, for him to hit his stride this early, that m- means a lot of endurance and a lot of luck and a lot of things have to fall into place. But it, from my vantage point, it seems like he's putting those pieces in the right place. Thank you. Uh, so last, let's sort of closing it out as somebody who, yeah. you know, started as an intern, rose through national politics, returned to their hometown to, uh, to serve uh, on a school board and engage in, in education in their own community for all, all those folks who are sort of sitting in an office, maybe listening to this podcast, want to figure out how they should engage, you know, want to make a difference, but aren't, aren't really sure how, do you have any advice you give people about how to, how to start a life of public service and, um, and where best to, to, to use your talents? Yeah. 
volunteer on a campaign, I just think campaigns are so fun and give you such energy. And at any stage of your career, you know, spending a few hours in a, you know, in a campaign office gives you such insight. It's something when I'm hiring people, uh, when I look on their resume and they have campaign experience, it's a huge uh, bonus fides for me because it just shows that, um, you, you know, you've been in a scrappy environment where you just got to do what you can and contribute where you can and not sort of wait for the org chart to come out and the direct, uh, you know, job descriptions. But yeah, so I mean, especially now too, with this resistance and so much activity, if maybe it's not a campaign, but it's Planned Parenthood or an organization, um, just spending some time volunteering, uh, especially if you're starting out and you're looking to, you know, maybe transition into politics or you're just graduating and you want to get into politics. There's, I, I say this to my nieces and nephews, just even if you want, don't even think you're going to end up in politics eventually, having that campaign experience early on, um, I think will open your eyes to a lot of interesting people, number one, and experiences, number two. So, yeah, that's my advice. Yeah. It's I, a great time to get And I, I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, and for most campaigns, all you got to do is show up and they'll, they'll put you to work. So it's the barrier to entry is low. Uh, they're, they're happy to have you. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of candidates. I mean, I think that's the one thing that people are pleasantly surprised uh, is that the candidates are there. I mean, they're often sitting next to you making their own phone calls. So it's, it's just, it's from a, you know, to sort of be a fly in the wall, uh, especially, you know, now with so many options, um, you can, you can really learn a lot and see a lot. I totally agree. Laura, thanks for talking to us today. It's really been a pleasure to have you on the, uh, an honorable profession. Thanks, Ryan. I think it's, uh, this podcast is such a service, so thanks for doing it. Oh, my, my pleasure. My pleasure. And I hope to see you soon. Sounds good. That'd be all great. All In right. Denver. <laughs> yes. Yes. I will be there. <laughs> all right. Cool. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produced this podcast. Special thanks to Casey Essie for letting me use her studio today. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we're keeping things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.